Hi everyone, and uh, welcome to um, the Project 2 overview uh, for ECE 3311 Principles of Communication system, Systems. So uh, in this video, I'm going to quickly go over uh, Project 2 and what's involved. Uh, I'm going to do a combination of like um, switching back and forth between um, uh, what we have here in terms of like the document um, that all of you should have um, should be looking at. This has been posted online um, in Canvas um, uh, and, and the Jupyter Notebook uh, that provides a lot of the sample code snippets that you'll probably have to like, you will um, leverage and uh, customize to answer all the questions in the handout. Okay, so all of you should have seen this and remember this project is due on Monday the 9th of November at 5 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. All right, so let's let's zoom in a little bit. Um, what's a better view? With there we go, much better, right? So the objective of this project, right, is several things. So project one was to introduce you to Python programming, right, and it's a very brief introduction, but also to highlight some of the kind of important tools that you'll need to use in uh, for the rest of this course. So for instance. Uh, things like how do you build lists, how do you use for loops, how do you define functions, classes, and the like. And then more signals, signal processing and communication oriented um, algorithm, um, uh, functions and libraries like NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, uh, things like NumPy arrays um, and um, convolution and FFTs, right? In this project, you'll be using a lot of that, right? So Specifically, what we're going to be doing is we're going to, this. A lot of this um, material is actually relevant to lectures four through seven, right? So, first of all, we're going to look at how we're going to model continuous analog waveforms. Even though um, uh, a lot of the stuff, like almost all the sort of like uh, structures that we have at our disposal, all the tools that we have in Python, everything's discrete, right? It's stored in lists or arrays and such. So how do you make a continuous waveform? How do you make an analog waveform in a continuous, uh, in a discrete setting like lists um, or arrays where you have specific elements assigned to a um, specific entry in a memory structure? And the answer is you're gonna have to have a lot of these to kind of emulate what would be an analog waveform. Then um, the next step is we're gonna look at how we convert analog waveforms to uh, some sort of sampled representation, uh, such as pulse amplitude modulation, PAM, right, and pulse coded modulation. So these are the topics of lecture four. Uh, then uh, this project will establish competency, will, will establish your competency in constructing types of line codes. Again, uh, that is something we saw in lecture six, uh, and uh, in particular to play with these line codes in a computer simulation environment. Um, I must emphasize that all of this is in order to reinforce your skill sets, build new skills in terms of doing computer simulations of communication systems using Python. So very, very important this project because this is your first project that actually deals with communication systems, right? Um, the other thing is eye diagrams. That's a topic of lecture seven um, to build, uh, to sort of understand how you implement this in Python and uh, explore it uh, and then try it out with some of the um, communication techniques that, were, that, that are in the previous bullets, right? Like PAM, PCM, and line codes. Finally, um, and this is kind of an interesting one uh, because it's, it's a little bit challenging. It's also the focus of our open-ended um, uh, open -ended question at the end of this project, which is file IO, file, input, and output. How do you read from files? How do you output to files, right? Write files. And in particular, we're gonna be looking at audio files. Um, and because later on in this course, we may be playing with other types of files, perhaps recorded uh, wireless signals and such. And you need to feel comfortable opening those files, processing those, uh, the data from those files using Python and potentially writing them back to another file for use somewhere else. So this, this, uh, this item here, this bullet is gonna be very important. And all of this, um, you'll be, uh, there, just like in the first project, 
there is a Jupyter notebook that's specifically created for this project, right? And, and a lot of sample code. So everything that you see, all the subsequent sections here, mirror, or actually the Jupyter notebook mirrors all these sections. So let me show you. Um, dee, 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 dee. I'm gonna stop sharing. And I'm gonna go to my alter ego on my Linux server over here. And I am going to share the screen. There we go. So this is what, this is the Jupyter notebook for project two, right? So this is also available um, uh, for download from Canvas, right? So just a heads up, that's there. So what I'm gonna be doing is a little bit of switching back and forth between my Linux box and my Windows box in terms of, um, you know, we'll look at a section and then we'll look at the uh, Python code that goes with it, All right? So stop sharing and go back to sharing here. All right, so preparation. Very importantly, um, the first step is how do you create an analog waveform in, in an environment that is obviously it's a computer programming environment. So uh, if you have all these samples, wait, samples, that doesn't sound very continuous. Well, what happens is in a lot of cases, we, we kind of get by in terms of uh, modeling analog waveforms by taking a lot of samples. We like really, really sample or create, generate samples such that it comes close to looking like an actual analog waveform. So this section, section two, is exactly um, to sort of help all of you kind of like check that out in order to sort of explore that concept, okay? Uh, through the, the, through a, a few sample bits of code, right? So, so for instance, the first thing we do is uh, in the sample code, there's something called, uh, you know, there's a variable called analog underscore waveform, right? Analog underscore wave FM. And uh, what you'll see is that this variable, the way it's constructed is it's a lot of samples of some sort of random waveform that squiggles along, right? And, and if you look at it, and here's a plot of it, looks analog to me. But if you, if you were able to zero in, if you were able to like, really like hyper zoom in to a very small segment of this, you'll just see discrete points, right? Every point corresponding to an amplitude value stored in a numpy array, right? And so what we do is we take this analog waveform and at the same time, what we do is we also, uh, what we're trying to uh, try out here is create something like rectangular pulses. So we have something called impulse train waveform. Right. And what that does, and this is a little bit like not as, as spectacular as the signal amplitude thingy here, right? Uh, because what, um, you know, like this, this analog waveform, because uh, you can actually see discrete point, discrete point, discrete point. So it's not really a rectangle as much as it is um, just sort of like many, many, many little points, right? And then many points that are zero, many points that are one, many points that are zero. And so what ends up happening is uh, like, you know, this is our attempt at again, approximating what uh, a rectangular waveform would look like. And what we're gonna do here, right, is so we have these guys, right? And so it's actually kind of cool. So between this marker here and there, there are a hundred points, right? So you don't, again, you don't see it because the human eye is not detecting the discrete points. But if, again, if you zoom in, you'll definitely see each one of those 100 points on the analog waveform above. Here, because we use something called a stem plot, you, you get to see every discrete point because it has a stem associated from zero going all the way to its value, in this case, one, for all the non-zero values of this rectangular pulse. So the purpose of this preparation, right, is to get you familiar with how do you set up a time domain waveform that approximate uh, that approximates an analog waveform but obviously it's discrete right because we're now going to do several operations on it for instance like what we did in lecture four we did a lot of pam and pcm uh operate like you know sort of like um uh, uh pam and pcm uh manipulations if you will of an analog waveform we'll be using these two in quite a few of those examples to come in this project right? 
just before continuing, um, just a heads up uh, for 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 most okay for a good chunk of this of this project. I'm trying to think how far. Oh yeah yeah yeah, including line coding. Um, we're going to be using these specifications, right? So we're going to be using a hundred samples, right? So that's the length of the overall transmission, uh, the pulse duration of the rectangular or train pulse. So it's going to be 10 on, 10 off, 10 on, 10 off, 10 on, 10 off. M is the upsampling factor for generating the analog waveform, right? Uh, and what does that mean? What happens is that tells me in terms of like upsampling, what that means is I, um, uh, if I want to increase the samples, if I want to, instead of having 100, but I want 1,000, samples, but I still have the general shape, what I do is something called upsampling. And then you might say, well, won't the, let's say for instance, this rectangular waveform look kind of weird because now you have stem, and then I'm gonna have nine zero values stem, nine zero values stem. Well, what happens is then it is, there's a technique where what you do is you fill in the gaps with what it should be from like one non-zero point to another zero point. But we'll talk about that um, like at another time. Then finally, the line coding pulse duration, right? Uh, that tells us about things like the, the period, right? Of the, of like, you know, of like one period of like one of those um, like pulse shapes for a line code. All right. And then of course there's question one. Question one, what I would like all of you to do is you see this kind of random squiggly thing here. I want all of you to create three cosine functions of different frequencies from zero to 100, okay? That the, the amplitude ranges from minus one to one, but it has different frequencies. Let's say you have one that's a very low frequency, so it's oh, like, you know, maybe a, a couple of periods from end to end. Then one of medium frequency, let's say quite a few periods, and then one of high frequency, let's say 10 periods within this, this range, right? because we're gonna be using those later on as well. Yeah, and those are just examples of the high frequency versus the low frequency and the medium frequency. So let's, let's take a look at uh, what the code looks like at the, in the Jupyter Notebook. So first of all, there's a lot of stuff you need to declare before you even start writing your first bit. So first of all, you're gonna to have to do a lot of importing. NumPy, SciPy, uh, the SciPy interpolate is going to be really important. Matplotlib, you're going to, you're going to be doing a lot of plotting for, for this. Uh, and then, of course, math. Okay. Um, what happens is we're doing a bit of like uh, the definitions for the plotting routines. So in terms of the X offset, Y offset, uh, essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to make all the plots a standard dimension. Because if you don't do that, you're going to have plots this big, this big, this big. And they're all going to look, they're all going to run amok, right? So when you actually produce a Jupyter notebook, they're going to be of different sizes, not going to look professional. This way, if you specify one place, the size and dimensions of those plots, you're golden. And then again, here's the parameters I was telling you about. Um, what we did is there is no, like, well, to best of our knowledge, there isn't like a nice interpolation function that we're aware of in Python? Maybe there is, but what we did anyway is we defined our own. So we, we defined something called interpolate 1D vector. So remember that interpolation thing that we talked about here, up here? Uh, yeah. What happens is this will take that vector and it's going to do the interpolation for you, right? So it's, what it's gonna do is it's gonna take a vector and the factor is by how much you're gonna interpolate by. So if you have a hundred element vector, you're going to interpolate by 10, it's now going to be a thousand element vector. And every sample is going to have nine zeros inserted in between two samples. So that's how you're going to get it increased by a factor of 10. And that's what this function does. You're going to be using this function. Okay, so just heads up. What we also did is we made our own quantization function, very similar to MATLAB's quantiz function, right? So it's called quantize. And again, you're going to be using this quite a bit when you do PCM, right? For the PCM section of this lab, 
uh, sorry, of this project, as well as at the end with the open-ended, when you take some mystery files and you quantize it, you turn into a, you use a PCM technique to convert it into a binary representation, then you convert back to a waveform. So you're gonna need all of these declared before you even start doing things like section one, which is the basic Python script. So this here, right? Um, what, this, what this thing does, right, analog waveform, uh, we just came up with some sort of squiggle and you can run it. And what it does is, what this guy does is literally, this squiggle is completely random. Every time you run it, it's gonna be a completely different thing because it, it, it basically calls on numpy random random. And what that'll do is, uh, the, what would we do is we take numpy random random, it produces a bunch, um, bunch of, bunch of uh, variables, right? And what it'll do is it's going to, it's going to take those, 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 um, those points and, and it's going to um, do exactly that. It's going to uh, produce, um, uh, where is it? It's going to take those random variables. It's going to put zeros in between them. It's going to connect the dots. And what you're going to get is something that looks like this, right? And what we also have here is the plotting routine. Uh, for generating both that as well as the impulse train, uh, like uh, sorry, the yeah, the impulse, uh, the the impulse train waveform, uh, this thing that uh, the rectangular rectangular pulses that we'll be using for a naturally sampled PAM, um, as well as for the um, instantaneously sampled PAM. Now, let's close that and go back to this. Oop. So now what happens is pulse amplitude modulation, just like in lecture four, um, we have two types, right? So imagine if you take this, right? This rectangular pulse, multiply it against this, this uh, analog waveform, you get that. That's exactly what it is. Right. On the other hand, this fella here is your instantaneously sampled PAM, right? And it's quite different. Remember, what was the difference between instantaneously sampled PAM and naturally sampled PAM? Well, what happens is, in naturally sampled PAM, we multiply the entire rectangular pulse against the entire shape. With instantaneously sampled PAM, we take one point of let's say on, on the curve, and we take that value and we multiply it against one of these levels. And that entire level will have that amplitude. It's not gonna be shaped to the analog waveform. But what happens is if we uniform, if we space these out, like, you know, periodically, take a value and assign that to the amplitude of the rectangular pulse. Take a value, assign it to the, uh, the amplitude of rectangular pulse. Take a value, assign it to the amplitude of rectangular pulse and continuously do that, we get flat top pan. And that's this guy here, okay? So, this, and, and the code is represented over here. Right? So here you're gonna be using something called NumPy multiply. Right. That's the, if you take two NumPy arrays, that's the best way to take the two and sample by sample, they will multiply out. Remember, zero times something will be zero. One times something will be something. That's something. That specific something. And then, of course, there's also a downsampling factor as well. And what happens is at the end of the day, you produce these two plots here. Right. Then PCM, very importantly, PCM is when we now, so, okay, before I continue, so question two, what's question two all about? Um, so remember the cosine functions I asked you to generate here in this section, right? So in question one, so uh, generate analog 
um, yeah, they, they, instead of this random squiggle, make three cosine functions of different frequencies. But question two asks is now, make both naturally sampled PAM and flat top PAM waveforms out of them. So at the end of the day, every cosine is gonna have a naturally sampled PAM version and an instantaneously sampled PAM version, okay? So that's gonna be the output of question two. Pulse-coded modulation, uh, what is it? So pulse-coded modulation, if you take flat top PAM and you quantize it, so use the function that we provided, quantize, uh, what you should get, okay, is instead of like just amplitude values all over a place, your quantization procedure, what it will do is it will round it to one of several established amplitude values that have a binary representation to it, okay? So again, use the code, right? Because what we're gonna ask you to do for question three, again, now you take those PCM, PCM waveform, uh, sorry, those um, flat top PAM uh, representations of the three cosines with different functions and apply quantization to it in order to create PCM waveforms of them, right? So the way that would work, is if you use the quantization routine that we have here. And what we did is we created equally spaced quantization levels from minus one to one, and it will map, it will, so it will round to the, so it will round to the nearest quantization level. And those are gonna be the only, the only allowable amplitude values permitted, okay, at the output. And each one's gonna have a binary representation. I did not specify a binary representation for each one of the levels. You're more than welcome to do that yourself. In fact, it's encouraged. You're gonna to have to do it for the open-ended part of this project. But what ends up happening is by doing this, you only have to play with only those levels and not, like, not have to worry about like, assigning binary representations for an infinite number of possible amplitude values. We've restricted to only this much and that's what PCM does. You take an infinite continuum of possible amplitude values from flat top pan and restrict it to only a, a certain set that you then assign a binary pattern to, a unique binary pattern to. And that's what uh, this code does here. Okay. Now, we switch gears a bit in, in this uh, project because then what we do is we go from pulse coded modulation right? Oh, before I forget. Um, once you do the PCM, then what, are, what, what we also, what, what would be great is don't forget to also take the original signal that you have, right? The analog, the, quant, uh, the, the quantized analog waveform and subtract off of it the original signal. And what you're going to get is the quantization error residual quantization error. That's going to be kind of handy. We're going to see that later on uh, with the open-ended question at the end of this project. So what we see here, these residuals, is because think about it, you have all those flat top PAMs, but we have an uh, analog waveform that's not flat tops. It's a, like a, like, you know, it's a, like a sort of this, uh, lots of curves and lots of degrees of freedom that are not represented by sort of flat steps. So what's going to happen is you're gonna have a lot of residual quantization error. So what happens is here, like what's really important, especially this bottom plot, is to show by how much that residual error occurs when we do this quantization into a PCM waveform. All right. Now, switching gears to line coding. So this was from lecture six. And okay, I promise you, no PSDs in this one, okay? No PSDs. Um, but what we do have here, what's kind of interesting, is uh, I do want you to generate the time domain representation of these line codes. So the way to do it here is uh, the Jupyter Notebook uh, has a sample code of how to do unipolar non-return to zero line coding. Okay? Qu 
question four, and this is a biggie, is I want you to also implement polar non-return to zero, unipolar return to zero, bipolar return to zero, Manchester non-return to zero, okay? And you should get something that looks like this, right? This is unipolar non-return to zero, and everything below it is everything else that I passed. So you should get a plot that looks very similar to this, okay? Alrighty. And in terms of the source code, looks very simple. This is, again, remember, this is for unipolar non-return to zero code. You're going to have to do something very similar for the other four types of waveforms. One thing to note, again, is some of your best friends are going to be things like append. You might say, what the heck is append? So append is you're adding, okay, you're adding, um, like, let's say one period of your pulse shape. So let's say, is this a one or is this a zero representation, right? So it's one pulse shape or another. And you and so let's say if you have a binary pattern, one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. So let's say you start off with whatever the zero representation is. Then you append the one representation. Then you append the next binary representation. Then you append. So that's how you create your line code transmission in Python. So you're gonna be using, so take this and mirror it. There are gonna be some differences. Right? There are definitely going to be some differences. Like, for instance, bipolar. Remember bipolar. Bipolar also has a little bit of memory. So, like, for specifically when you transmit a binary one, remember it alternates between whether it's a positive amplitude or negative amplitude. So, you're probably going to have to use a conditional somewhere in there, too. Right? So, that's line coding. All right. Now, eye diagrams. So eye diagrams are kind of tricky. Um, and I included a snippet of code that you're probably going to use quite a bit, um, either in this course or maybe anything else that you're going to analyze communication systems or some sort of transmission of some sort of waveform. So what, um, what the eye diagrams do, okay, they don't look great. Like, for instance, I'm going to ask you to do eye diagrams for the unipolar non-return to zero and the Manchester non-return to zero and a bunch of others, right? And you're going to get things that look like this, right? So, and, 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 and so what happens is what I would like the, like, uh, for, for, for you to do is to, to get the, um, uh, the, the eye diagrams for, for both these guys, like for all these pulse shapes. Uh, again, I actually, hmm, I might have goofed. Yeah, so actually, this is not completely correct. Hmm, I'm going to have to look into that. So what happens is, actually, check out my lecture seven, I think. I'm going to have to revisit this. But what, what happens is, you should be having, this is what, what happens if you transmit over and over and over again. Um, Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so very important. Like, you should not be getting something like this. And why is that? Include that in your answer for question five. <laughs> yeah, no, but seriously, um, you should not be getting this. And at an answer why, and at an answer in question five, why that is, why figure five is actually not the actual eye diagram. Okay. And, and, and you might want to check, um, like, so let's say we go, here, why that is. So almost all the code is correct, but there's one thing here, right? So you want to plot the eye. So what's important? So what do you want to do? So what, what happens is um, when plotting the eye, right, um, what you want to do is you want to 
But remember, it's over one period or one symbol period. So, and what do we have here? We have something that looks like one, two, three, four, five symbol periods. So, so okay, so I already answered for you. Okay, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, stop myself. So what you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need a technique. So if you notice here, so this, I'm gonna give you a little bit of hint how to fix this problem. And what you gotta do is you gotta take this for loop, right? So plot the I diagram. You gotta make absolutely certain that you're only plotting one symbol period at a time. And you gotta make sure you have the right starting point of the symbol period and the end point of that symbol period. And you gotta progressively shift it along your entire line code transmission. Otherwise, um, it's not correct, right? Otherwise you get like, because what it looks like here is Essentially, it's like somehow I'm going through every period and I'm plotting the same waveform for both the negative, like, you know, what is a zero value and what is a one value, um, both within the same period and next and next and next and next and next, which is not quite right. You want it over one simple period. Same thing here. Manchester, this looks good. This looks correct. If you are doing for both a one value and a zero value for every period, of the five symbol periods in this waveform, but we're looking for a line code for just one period. Okay, uh, sorry, an I diagram for just one period. All right, good to know. I'm glad I caught that. Otherwise, people will say, "What the heck, professor? I thought an I diagram just looks like 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 this, not like multiple periods." Then you would be correct. Okay. Now the real world application. So up in Canvas, let me share that with you. In Canvas, you should be able to download, I know, you can see the professor view of Canvas. But what happens is in Canvas, you should see one, two, three WAV files, right? And those WAV files are mystery WAV files we got from YouTube. You know, everyone's trusted source of um, multimedia. And what happens is the goal of this real world application is to read into a Python code, like a program, uh, those audio files, okay? Plot them, plot the time domain representations, and also listen to it, play the audio files using Python. And, um, and very, very, very importantly, um, you gotta have to make sure that you use the right sampling rate right? So this requires a little bit of um, uh, trial and error, but like for instance, like a sampling rate of 44.1 might not be completely off. 44.1 kilohertz. So maybe something to try, right, as a starting point. So then once you plot it and once you listen to it, so just like, you know, it could be like Professor Wiglinski saying hello there uh, for 10 seconds, you know, just describe what each file says. If, and, and the thing is, uh, if you don't choose the right sampling rate, um, it will either sound like really fast, like really, 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 too fast, or so you really need to choose the right sampling rate. Otherwise, it's, it, it will sound unintelligible and maybe even slightly funny. Now, question two is the hard one. Question two is to take those audio signals and quantize them. Use it, uh, so we're basically doing PCM. I want you to quantize it using a 10 bit. So you need to figure out how many levels does a 10 bit quantizer use, right? Convert it into a binary representation. I'll leave it to you how you want to convert it into binary. Then uncode it from binary back into those analog waveforms and reconstruct the audio signal. And then plot the quantization error. It's exactly like the PCM section. And, and then what ends up happening is um, play the reconstructed and describe how it sounds based on a 10-bit quantizer. All right. So in terms of submission, same thing as before, Jupyter Notebook, uh, nothing else, no PDFs, no nothing, no audio files, just the Jupyter Notebook, please. And if you don't submit it by the due date, you get a, like your team gets a zero for the project, for, for the report part. Okay. 
just make sure you include documentation, who you are, your names, submission date, the, the course number, the project number. Um, make sure everything is documented. Very important, just don't give raw code. That's gonna make it very difficult to grade, right? And adequate commenting is worth five points, so don't waste those points, please. Finally, respond to all questions in the handout. Please, please, please respond to everything, otherwise you're throwing away points. Okay, folks, uh, so hopefully that was a somewhat useful overview of project two. Obviously, if you have any questions, please ask Kartik or myself. Slack is probably the best way. Um, also, check out our office hours. Uh, we'll be glad to help. Okay, with that, uh, good luck with this project, and uh, uh, definitely reach out to us if you have any questions. Take care.